It is a pleasure to be here with all of you today discussing how we can allow Python to not only succeed but thrive within the DOE, within the National Lab System, within associated research sites. As per our last call, we're going to run this as an open discussion with a couple of guest panelists and a couple of host panelists. Let me very quickly run you through just a couple of details before we jump into it. First, this meeting will be recorded. And so if you're not able to attend this meeting for the entire duration of it, or if you have colleagues who you want to share some of this material with, let us know and we can distribute the recording to you. For those of you who got an invite through the guest participants or through any of the mailing lists, we will be sharing the recording and any slides or other materials through those channels as well. Do note that this is a mixed audience of people who have clearance and do not have clearance. And so, if you have any questions or any comments, make sure that these are things that you can share publicly. We will be doing these events on a monthly basis, and our next event is planned for the last week of January. We don't have too many details for it just yet, but we'll let you know the moment we have our speakers locked in and the specific date and time locked in. Let me share with you the general structure and theme of this evening's call. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce our host panelists and our guest panelists, and they'll tell you a little bit about themselves and a little bit about what kind of questions that they're here to help answer, what kind of discussions they would like to have with all of you. We'll invite one of our guest panelists, Ross, to come share with you a couple of prepared thoughts on the use of Python in a scientific scenario. And that will launch us into some open discussion and some very interesting back and forth with it. There is a Q&A widget that is available via BlueJeans where you can submit any questions you have while the presentation is going. And our guest and host panelists will be monitoring that to answer those questions directly. And if those questions are beyond what can be answered in a simple chat box, we'll bring that into our open discussion portion after Ross pro provides his uh, prepared remarks. Our theme for this event, or for tonight's call, is why Python? Trying to understand why the choice of Python for our scientific needs as scientific computing staff. And so with that said, why don't I introduce our panelists, and then we'll jump into the prepared remarks and then open up the discussion. I'd like to first start by introducing our host panelists from Brookhaven, Tom and Dan. Then we'll speak to our host panelists from uh, APS, uh, Pete and Alec. And then uh, we'll introduce our guest panelists, Stefan and Ross from BITS. But before I do that, I should introduce myself. I know many of you. I recognize many of your names. My name is James Powell. I don't work at a national lab, but I have interacted with many of you through my work providing training to the national labs. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And like many of you, I have a vested professional interest in seeing Python thrive. If you'd like to ask any questions about how do I get scientific staff to appreciate technical sophistication, to increase their ability to deploy that technical sophistication, especially around scientific computing tools like NumPy or Pandas, I would love to answer for them for you, either in our open discussion or in the chat. But with that said, Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Dan Allen in the Data Science and Systems Integration Program at NSLS2. I'd be happy to answer questions in the space of ground up efforts around the DOE to share tools across facilities and within facilities. Thanks. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, so, hi, hi, I'm Thomas Caswell. I'm also with the Data Science and Systems Integration Program at NSLS2. Um, in my in other hats, I'm also the uh, Matplotlib project lead and a core developer of H5Pi. And I'm happy to answer questions about how to interact with large scale um, uh, user, pro you know, community driven projects, particularly in the context of working within a lab. Pete, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Pete Jemian. I'm working with the Beamline Controls Group at the Advanced Photon Source. Uh, be really happy to answer any questions on the Blue Sky implementation at the Advanced Photon Source. Also about Beamline Controls, the Nexus scientific data format, or even on small angle scattering. And Alec, would you like to introduce yourself? We'll give Alec just a couple of seconds to get his audio working. Alec, I think you may be muted. Is that better? Fantastic. Sorry. 
Um, I'm Alex Sandy. I'm an associate uh, division director at the APS, um, kind of in the area of uh, beamline controls, uh, scientific software engineering, and data management, computational X-ray scattering, plus quite a few kind of mechanical engineering groups. I kind of got uh, parachuted into this because uh, Joe Sullivan is away. So um, I will, I'm sure, pass off any questions to Pete. Um, but if something comes my way, I'm happy to try and answer it. Now, before I introduce our guest panelists, I do want to respond to one very important question that came up in the Q&A widget. There's a question from one of our participants or from one of the attendees, why are there no women panelists? Unfortunately, two of our panelists, uh, namely Jean Schuler and Jane Harriman from Livermore, were not able to join us today. But as a long-term strategic goal, this group does want to help to encourage the, a good balance in all of the panelists. We are looking for additional host panelists, people who would like to come and join us and speak about how you work. We are very eager to ensure that there is diversity in that. Unfortunately, we were not able to make that work for tonight, but this is something that we do understand is a critical failure in many of the different scientific computing community, communities that we interact with. And it's something that we're aware of and something that we are very eager to address. Now, with that said, let me introduce two of our guest panelists for the evening. Tonight, we are joined by Ross Barnowski and Stefan van der Walt. Uh, Ross is a scientific software developer at the Berkeley Institute for Data Scientists supporting open, sci open source scientific Python projects. He's active in both NumPy and NetworkX. He holds a PhD in nuclear engineering from UC Berkeley and has served as an assistant research scientist and lecturer in the Department of Nuclear Engineering, teaching at the graduate level. Stefan is a senior research data scientist at BIDS and the founder of Scikit-Image and a core contributor to projects like NumPy and SciPy. He's also a fellow NumFocus board director. He serves on the steering committees of NumPy, SciPy, and the PSF's working group and spends much of his time coordinating the scientific Python ecosystem for which he's been involved for over 15 years. And so with that said, Stefan and Ross, would you like to briefly add any details that I've missed and also let people know what specific questions you're looking for? Ross? Uh, sure, thanks for the very kind introduction, James. Um, I think you just about covered it. I, I'm currently at BIDS um, supporting open source software uh, on a team led by Stefan, and we have uh, three other members of that team, and um, it's it's a true joy. And in terms of questions to ask, um, I'm happy to field questions on anything. Uh, particularly, we've been doing a lot of work with pedagogical material for projects um, and coordinating between different uh, projects in the ecosystem, as well as anything about uh, NumPy or NetworkX that I have a little more insight than um, any other project, but um, please feel free to ask me anything. And Stefan? Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, so my background is in electrical engineering and I later turned applied mathematician. Um, and a lot of the work uh, I started doing for the scientific Python ecosystem happened sort of as a distraction from my PhD, um, as many, many of the other project uh, founders. Um, but yeah, I've been fortunate to um, to work on open source uh, scientific tools full time since uh, 2015 at BIDS. Um, and you know, initially, I, I worked more on the on the projects themselves, and that's that's now changing more and more to coordinating be, between the projects. And Ross will also tell you a little bit about that effort. So yes, happy to talk about the, uh, the scientific Python ecosystem, its history. Um, uh, coordination efforts we've got underway and uh, how, we're, how we're trying to build um, a bigger, more inclusive uh, community. Fantastic. So with that said, Ross, would you like to share some of your prepared remarks on, the, on Python as a language for effective scientific computing? Okay, everyone can see this all right. Um, I don't see myself or anything, so if there are any problems, please speak up and let me know. Um, but that said, um, Thanks again for the kind introductions. Uh, and this is the presentation that I prepared um, in response to the prompt, why Python for scientific computing? Um, so that's sort of the high level question that I'll be answering. Um, 
and I'll give you my personal take as a, you know, over the last decade as a, as a scientific researcher and, and user of scientific Python, Python projects. Um, and also a little bit of perspective, my perspective on what the outlook is uh, looking ahead. So before I do that, I'll just introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I actually started my research career, uh, such as it is, in the National Lab System. My very first experience was when I was summer after my sophomore year in college, I participated in a SULI internship at uh, Argonne National Lab in, the, uh, nuclear, in one of the nuclear um, instrumentation groups. Um, after that, I went to Livermore in the summer of 2009, working in the nuclear data group. Um, and that was actually the first time that I ever used Python at that point, not even scientific Python, just Python as a uh, editing text files and parsing outputs and things like that. Um, but I had a, a truly fantastic mentor there, Marie Ann Descal, who uh, sort of convinced me that I wanted to go to grad school afterwards. And so that's what I did when I, after I graduated. I went back to uh, UC Berkeley in the nuclear engineering department. Um, so I spent six years there in grad school and then became a postdoc and then uh, a research scientist and lecturer. And that whole time, um, you know, I was affiliated both with the nuclear engineering department and also the applied nuclear physics group at LBL. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a nuclear engineer by training. Uh, specifically, I worked on radiation instrumentation. So that's radiation detection and measurement. Um, especially gamma ray spectroscopy and imaging um, and sort of a theme underlying this entire talk as I sort of go through some of the, the old research um, that I performed throughout my career is that scientific Python and open source software is, is really the key component that made my research possible. None of what we accomplished would have been possible without these tools. And so one of, oh, you know what? Let me also expand here a little bit. Um, the, so just a couple quick hits application-wise. Um, one of the things that we developed, uh, that I and my colleagues developed while I was in graduate school was this imaging modality, which of course we had to give a name. And since it's DOE, also an acronym too. Uh, so we called it Scene Data Fusion or SDF for short. Um, in practice, all this is, is a combination of existing gamma ray imaging technologies with, or modalities with um, mobile imaging, gamma ray imaging instruments and computer vision algorithms, specifically uh, a subset of algorithms called SLAM, standing for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. So these are algorithms that give you a real-time estimate of your location and orientation within a scene as well as a representation, some sort of model representation of the scene itself. In our case, we were interested in 3D representations of the scene. And so this is um, the culmination of sort of six years of work on in this particular direction was we actually got to take one of our prototype imaging instruments to Fukushima in 2017. So we were in a small village that at the time was still part of the exclusion zone and had not been explicitly decontaminated yet, or at least not entirely. Um, and we got to perform a measurement campaign there in, con uh, in collaboration with the JAEA, the J Japan Atomic Energy Agency. Um, so here's just a, a, a quick uh, result from that measurement campaign. You see on the right, there's a Google satellite image of the measurement area, which is the, the rear parking lot of a senior center. Um, and sort of on the left, you can see the circuitous path that my colleague and I took um, throughout the measurement area. Uh, the red sort of represents the gamma ray interactions that we were measuring. And then of course the, the contour surfaces uh, represent the reconstructed distribution of uh, a specific, in this case, cesium-137 uh, radionuclide in the area. And then there's the black and white uh, point cloud model, which doesn't come through a ton in this, this small image. Um, but if anyone has ever tried to do 3D visualization in Python, you perhaps recognize uh, this image on the left as having been made with Mayavi. So we've used a lot of different Python-based um, 3D visualization packages, and Mayavi was one of them. And um, 
of course, uh, another application was sort of taking the same imaging modality and instead of moving around the scene, we could do take a more traditional approach for some Im imaging applications where you have a very constrained imaging space, such as uh, small animal imaging for drug discovery and evaluation. Um, and so we did some studies of applying some of these gamma ray imaging techniques to um, it, you know, using a, a tomographic methodology instead of this moving uh, an object around a scene. Of course, you see on the right, the matplotlib um, slices through the three different dimensions of a reconstructed source here. In this case, a, a line source also CZ-137. Um, and that was sort of a, a, a pet project of mine that I was really excited by uh, because of the potential medical applications. So those are a couple of things that I worked on. Um, I mostly share all this detail because I'm going to be answering the question, why Python, by giving my own personal perspective. Um, and so I wanted to sort of color my perspective by my experience. So during my research, um, one of the main focuses was systems integration. So of course we have all these uh, computer vision devices with LIDARs, um, high frame rate cameras, uh, immersion IMUs, immersion monitoring units, uh, GPS on occasion, um, you know, and so it was all about interfacing with hardware and then synchronizing data from all these different disparate sources. Um, another main thrust was real time acquisition, um, not real time in the strict sense of, you know, things have to be done within three milliseconds or else it's a failure, but more, um, doing the analysis while the measurement is being performed. Of course, this is really important for things like uh, what we were doing in Fukushima, where we can do sort of on the fly path planning based on the feedback that we're getting from the instrument. And from a software perspective, that means that there was, you know, distributed computing was important. We have a lot of different nodes that are doing pre-processing, analysis, acquisition. Uh, they all have to communicate with each other and load balancing is very important there. Um, the final point that I wanted to just make is uh, a lot, you know, typically what I was doing um, was what you would consider, I don't know, medium scale computing. So the, the data sets that we would collect are on the order of gigabytes. We're not talking about terabytes or petabytes. Um, and, you know, data throughputs on the order of hundreds of megabytes a second. So it's not like, you know, we didn't have crazy computational constraints and that definitely um, you know plays into my own personal perspective and, and what I would consider myself more of, of an expert in. Okay, so with all that background out of the way, onto the question, why Python? So I've, I could talk about this forever, but I'll try to keep it short um, and sort of pepper in some examples from my time as a imaging and uh, signal processing researcher and break it down into four main points. And um, as seen here, you know, the fact that it's a general purpose language, the fact that Python is a great language in terms of saving researchers and developers time uh, really prioritizes that. And in my opinion, it's an extremely effective language for communicating scientific ideas and technical information. And then of course the uh, community-based model that scientific Python has sort of organically grown um, from, and I think that's an extremely important component to why Python is, is uh, an answer for scientific computing going forward. So just to take the first of these points, the fact that it's a general purpose programming language, I just lifted a, um, an excerpt from the SciPy 1.0 paper, which is published in Nature Methods a couple years ago now. Um, and of course, highlight a couple key points broadens the scope of problems when you use a, a general purpose language as opposed to say a application specific language or a language that was designed for say i don't know concurrency or something like that and then adding on uh, more general purpose features after the fact that's a in my opinion a less efficient way to get people to adopt your language um, so this is a key component to why python has become so broadly used in, in science. Um, of course, the sources of data is really important because everybody is generating data and storing data and uh, sharing data in just incredibly uh, diverse ways now. And so 
having access to data is, is key for data-driven research, obviously. Um, and then, of course, increasing the size of the community of people who can contribute um, and use the various tools. And I have a couple of the references there if you want to check these out. I think this one's really cool because it explains the motivation position paper from 1995 when I was, uh, let's eight. Uh, <laughs> So this is, it's been a long time coming with, uh, with growing the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and of course, another key component with Python being a general language is the ability to integrate with other languages, specifically, you know, system level programming languages like C, C++. Um, there are many different use cases for doing this. Um, one of them might be performance. So this is um, a very common use case where you have a chunk of code, you've recognized one particular piece is performance critical uh, and it's the bottleneck for your analysis and of course you can then write that in a more performant language provide a high level wrapper to it um, this is a very efficient way to work because you don't get hung up on using low level system uh, programming languages to solve everything um, there's also the use case of extending base of the python language um, if you want to add custom algorithms, interfaces, data structures that are more generally useful, and here I think the canonical example is uh, the ND array structure provided by NumPy, um, which is a you know a general purpose data structure that is added as an extension to uh, Python, and then an application that is always really important, but I think especially important in the national lab arena is uh, wrapping existing code. And there are two use cases that really come to mind that I personally experienced a lot in uh, grad school and doing research is where you have uh, legacy code that was perhaps written by someone who retired 10 years ago and you ask your advisor like, hey, I'm interested in this. And they say, oh yeah, so-and-so did this, uh, just use that. And then of course it's, it's very difficult to read. It's in a language you don't know, um, but you want the results that that code produces. And so the ability to wrap the, to wrap it and be able to use the code and then attack it incrementally in terms of understanding, improving, um, that removes you know the biggest bottleneck in terms of computing research in, in my experience. Um, and then another application or another use case is when you are using commercial, for example, commercial hardware or other um, software from vendors that have been purchased. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail right there. I just wanted to mention, you know, that this extensibility is a fundamental feature of Python. Um, it's a key, you know, the flexibility is extremely important into making Python what it is today in terms of uh, scientific computing applications. And there are many, many, many um, tools in addition to the Python C API, for example, that allow you to extend the language um, for these various different use cases. And so I wanted to touch a little bit uh, personal experience on the wrapping um, aspect. So we in my research, we had these, let me actually just out so we can see this without scrolling. Um, we had these excellent digitizers that we purchased from a company in Germany that did uh, multi-channel multi -channel digitization for our radiation spectroscopy signals. Unfortunately, the software that came to run those digitizers, um, it was written in C, which was fine, but it was baked into this Windows specific GUI tool toolkit uh, that only ran on Windows XP and of course all these problems. And so that was a, a major constraint. Um, and the way that we get around that is by, so we had an excellent researcher, Cameron Bates, who um, hopefully maybe he's in the audience, but I think he's currently at LANL. Um, he was in graduate school with me and he did the lion's share of work of, you know, pulling out the acquisition specific code uh, and wrapping it up and also want to credit him with convincing me of the importance of the Python C API, C API and also giving me my trial by fire in that particular um, category. But uh, as a result of this, 
we can do then it, it just removes so many barriers. So now we have this complicated C uh, system programming language that that boils down into let me zoom out again. Um, you know, just very simple. Of course, we can now just call these functions from Python. So communicating with and acquiring data from the data acquisition system goes from thousands and thousands of uh, baked in Windows GUI code into just a couple lines. Um, another main, so now we can use this in, in a much more flexible way. If you want to just do something quickly, um, you write five lines of code in order to interface with the hardware. You can write your own GUIs. Um, we had web UIs so that we could run, you know, start acquisition while we weren't actually physically in the lab. Um, and another major point is that we instantly gained a, a huge measure of platform independence from this. So now we could work on Linux, which is where most of the other hardware that we used, um, that's the software was, was Linux specific, and that was critically important for us to make progress. Um, so the second main point that I wanna talk about and why I think Python is such a great language for scientific research and computing is that uh, it really optim it prioritizes developer time. Um, we have some languages, of course, that uh, are compiled and they might, you know, build slowly, but then run extremely fast. Um, here is Guido's take on it from, I think, 1998, where he said, Python is five to 10 times faster than using C uh, or C++. I would argue <laughs> that, that you know, that's a perspective from someone who is obviously a very good C programmer. Um, for others who might not know the language as well, you know, add another factor of 5, 10, 50, 100 uh, to that characterization. But uh, the point stands that, you know, Python, it's, it's a very quick language for you to get your idea, to express your ideas in a way that is, uh, that can be evaluated right away. Um, and something that I think the scientific Python ecosystem really brings to the table through NumPy arrays and all the array extensions and, and many other data structures, sparse data structures, trees, graphs, et cetera, um, is that these are really nice interfaces that provide low level tools, but that have very readable and expressive uh, syntax. So it makes performant code that is very easy to both write and read. Um, and also finally, it enables uh, an incremental approach to data analysis. So rather than having to figure out, you know, data allocation strategies and all these low level things in order just to get a simple program to run, you can start with, you know, the smallest subset of data, begin testing and evaluating your ideas, and then scaling up incrementally as you run into bottlenecks in terms of performance or something like that, then you can address those problems as they crop up rather than having to solve everything all at once up front. Um, and so just to give an example of that, this is something, an example from my time as a researcher. In fact, I hope that there's no one, so I, I taught a graduate class in uh, gamma ray spectroscopy and imaging. I hope that none of the students for this year's edition are in the audience because I'm giving away the home, the answer to the first uh, lab assignment. But here is some data that is collected from um, the using that digitization system I was previously talking about. So this is what a, a digitized uh, preamplifier output signal looks like from a high purity germanium detector. Uh, all of the interesting information lives in this rise time here um, in the uh, single, the amplitude of this, this region sort of encodes the total energy deposited, which is what we care about for spectroscopy. Um, there's also this, you know, exponential decay, which is a, is a characteristic of the RC time constant of the preamplifier. Um, and so one of the things that we want to do, I mean, the signal is, is very nice, but of course it's very noisy. If we look at the top and we're trying to do spectroscopy here, it's subject to a lot of noise. So we would like to apply some sort of signal processing to um, get the noise down and also sort of deconvolve some of these long tail effects that we get from uh, the preamplifier response. And so there's the canonical way of doing this in the digital domain is actually a, a, time, a time analysis, time series analysis based approach um, for generating trapezoidal shaped signals. 
and I don't want to like all of the examples here, we could talk forever about them and I'm happy to, um, but just the, the highest level possible overview is that this is basically an algorithm where you can generate the trapezoidal uh, output using very simple operations. So in this case, the Z to the minus value parameter is a, that's just a delay. There's addition, subtraction, accumulators. Um, and so there's this diagram here sort of gives you a blueprint of how you could do this in code. And uh, since it's just simple operations, simple mathematical operations, um, we can use NumPy. And so that's choosing some parameters for these values, the, the K, the M, and the big M. Um, without going into detail, these are just values that I happen to know are uh, work relatively well. And then the second component here is to uh, implement the delays. And so since we have these uh, time constrained snapshots, um, we can just use NumPy indexing, right? So these are just implementing delays uh, by indexing. It's very straightforward, uh, easy to understand. Uh, shift enter. And then applying the actual algorithm itself, you know, if we go back and see, you know, it's just delay, some with the undelayed signal, apply another delay, some with the uh, signal. And if we look at the implementation, right, this, this translates extremely straightforwardly into an algorithm for applying the shaper. Um, so if we do that, there's a couple extra steps. You know, we did some shifting, so we're going to pad to get back to uh, align our shape signal with the original input signal. Uh, there's also some gain correction that we get from the trapezoidal filter, and then we can look at our results. And look at that. Um, so that was a very simple analysis. We ran it on a, signal, a single signal in order to sort of evaluate that we, you know, at least qualitatively, that the filter output is looking as we expect. Um, so now that we have some confidence that this filter works generally how we want it to, we then move on to scaling it up. Of course, for spectroscopy, we don't care about a single interaction. We care about uh, accumulating many interactions and looking at the spectrum, the energy spectrum from that uh, set of interactions. And this is a great thing about having array data. So if we just notice we take exactly the same analysis as before, except we added dimensions. So now if we treat our data as um, each row is an individual signal, and then the column represents the sample, sample number for all the signals, then all we have to do is uh, expand our indexing, our slicing operations to multiple dimensions, um, make sure that we are performing the mathematical operations over the appropriate axes, and then we have a very nice, straightforward, self-contained uh, bit of analysis that we can now run on multiple signals. So if we have the, the full data set that has 1,100 signals in it, uh, we run our, our function on it using the same things. And now, with extremely minimal changes to the code, just handling multiple dimensions, we get outputs for all of these signals. And notice that it's extremely performant. Um, we didn't have to add any for loops or anything like this. Of course, Python users are familiar with this, or NumPy users, this is not you know, groundbreaking, but I think that this is a, a major feature of why Python is so important for data analysis for scientific research. Um, so just to summarize a, a couple things about from this example, um, if you look the, you know, back to our algorithm as it was laid out graphically here, and then our implementation is extremely similar. So if we look at, you know, there's a, it's very straightforward mapping between the idea and the implementation. I think the only nod to a computer, uh, you know, a computational consideration is the fact that we, I, I cast here to larger integer types just to make sure that there's no overflows in the, in the cumulative sums. Other than that, it's, it's a very straightforward mapping. Um, let me do this. So that is obviously a huge feature. Um, and then, of course, a demonstration of that incremental approach. Start with one signal, gain confidence that we know what we're doing, you know, test, um, test all our corner cases at a single signal, and then scale up to bigger data. But that also begs the question, what if we want to scale up further? So 1,100 signals is one thing. What if we have a billion? Um, too many to fit into uh, memory. 
or let's say that we've identified the cumulative sum or some other mathematical operation as a performance bottleneck. Well, we can consider using um, these other tools that extend some of the functionality of uh, NumPy arrays to other, um, or they add functionality to NumPy arrays. So for if we have huge data sets, we could consider Dask, or if we have access to massive, um, like say supercomputers, or um, if we have a GPU and it'll help, we can consider using that. Uh, I also, since I mentioned Dask, I actually wanted to just bring this up real quick. Um, we can just using a feature from Dask, I, I ripped this right out of Dask's documentation and just applied it to the, uh, the preamp signals that we used in the previous example. Um, if we, oh, that's a little, so the repper has this like fancy um, view, but if we, you know, try to take advantage of Dask's uh, chunking mechanism, and then this, this part I think is really cool. If you notice, we can actually apply the analysis that we wrote, assuming that the input was NumPy arrays on Dask arrays. We have a, a Dask array input and we're going to run a NumPy specific or what seemingly NumPy specific um, analysis on it. And you'll notice that it works and the output is also a Dask array. Um, so in terms of interoperability of these packages that provide additional features on top of existing uh, array functionality from NumPy. I, this is extremely powerful. Um, let me unzoom here. And for those interested, you know, this, this is, it's very powerful and it works because Dask implements uh, some of the protocols provided by NumPy that are designed to sort of allow NumPy to be used as an array API rather than necessarily a specific implementation. Um, and it, it allows for there to be very easy interoperability with other array libraries that are based on uh, NumPy. And this is extremely powerful. If you're interested in reading more, we, there's uh, NumPy enhancement proposals, NEPs, uh, that sort of describe these various different protocols. And I would definitely recommend checking those out. Um, anyway, so that was um, a bit about you know, trying to demonstrate from my perspective, at least, how Python saves developers time. Um, and a sort of a very related point is that I also think that Python is an extremely effective language for communicating technical information. And so we have another example to highlight this point. So this is a um, this is an equation that's in my thesis and in one of the papers I published, and it's it's a standard maximum likelihood, uh, expectation maximization, algorithm. There's a couple special notations that we added to sort of spice it up a little bit, but you know, this is typically how this information is conveyed. Um, but when you go ahead, you can also translate this directly to code. And um, in Python, it's, you know, this, I would argue, you know, I'm an engineer by training, not a mathematician, not a, um, a physicist or anything like that. So uh, this notation is is much conveys less face value information to me than this one does, and I think that's true for a lot of people who are becoming more and more adept at reading and writing code. Um, and of course, another humongous advantage of having a representation like this is not only is it readable, but it's executable. And this is an incredibly important way um, or in important feature for communicating ideas and allowing other people to extend your ideas. And so I just want to run through another quick example um, that this time in gamma ray image reconstruction that uses this maximum likelihood algorithm. We'll focus on a particular uh, gamma ray imaging modality called Compton imaging. I don't want to get into detail. This is like one of my favorite things in the world, but <laughs> I'll, I'll Try to keep it as short as possible. One of the cool things about Compton imaging is it's based entirely on the physics of gamma ray scattering. Um, and some of the consequences of this particular uh, quirk or this particular constraint is that um, you, instead of getting, you know, say a ray that points in the direction of the, the incident gamma ray, um, we're only able to constrain the 
potential incident direction of a gamma ray to a cone. So we can only con constrain one of the possible uh, angles that define the ray, uh, which means we get a cone in the imaging space, which is kind of cool. Um, and another very cool thing about Compton imaging is that you can, uh, there is no lensing, there's no collimation. Um, it's based entirely on kinematics. So that means that if you design uh, your camera in a specific way, you can have, you're sensitive to photons coming from all directions. So it's basically uh, a limitless field of view um, gamma ray imaging modality. And again, so we just have um, a simulated data set. So if, if I go back to the maximum likelihood, these various things we have, you know, this alpha, which is the system matrix, which basically the row dimension is, uh, and I, I didn't mention, but this is list mode, MLEM. So list mode means that each individual um, row in our system matrix corresponds to a single uh, photon interaction. And then the column corresponds to, in this, you know, the imaging space. So in this case, we have a 2D pixelated uh, imaging space. Um, and so if we load this and then let me just bring this up. So I did a, you know, a terrible rectilinear mapping of the sphere onto uh, a plane, you know, one degree per pixel. Of course, it's subject to all of the, the it's, a, it's a terrible mapping, but whatever. This is a very simple example. Um, another thing to notice here is that we have, we're using scipy.sparse, and this isn't something that, you know, comes out of the equation in print, or from the equation. If you look here, we have these uh, interesting notations uh, where one of the indices intersects the other one. And that's supposed to be a nod to the fact that when you have cones going back into the imaging space, the majority of the pixels aren't intersected. So you don't need to consider consider those in the reconstruction. Um, so this is a great way to save time uh, and memory in the computation and something that is very difficult to communicate in the um, in the, the mathematical formula, but comes out straight away um with the, oh what did i add oh i added a space here <laughs> so um i also want to point out that as of yesterday um Stefan and many other people have have started leading the push to adding a, a an array interface to scipy.sparse so if you've ever used uh scipy sparse before that should be cause for celebration it was merged yesterday. Will be hopefully uh, expected to be available in the SciPy 1.8 release. Um, so please keep your eye peeled for that. I'm I'm super excited about that. Um, but anyways, you can see here, you know, the advantage that we get from sparsity. This is only about 30% full. Uh, this becomes much more clear if we just take a look at what this actually looks like. Um, if we look at the system matrix here, let me zoom out so we get a better centered image. Um, so you can so you can see the cones and see the cones interacting with the, each other in the image space, and of course it, it's it's pretty obvious where that we're looking at a point source directly ahead. And it's a very simple example, um, but that's sort of what the the uh, imaging basis this this cone basis looks like. And then, of course, so we have our system matrix. Let's try our technique. We have a, we have a an executable implementation of the um, the iterative maximum likelihood technique. So we can just go ahead and we'll start by using the back projection of all of the cones as our best estimate for what the initial image looks like. Um, we're ignoring sensitivity, which is the S in this case, um, because it's a very simple example and just try 10, 10 iterations of maximum likelihood. And how did we do? So let's do this, right? So that's an example of, you know, extremely straightforward equation, uh, communicates, in my opinion, much more information than the original, you know, published uh, notation did. And now in, you know, 20 lines of code or less, you can actually try it out on real data. And I think that is the true power in terms of communicating ideas and allowing others to build on top of your own ideas. And I have to say that I struggled understanding this concept for much, much, you know, this, this is very quick, but this took forever for me to understand without having this implementation available. And then afterwards, I think it was much easier to com communicate these ideas 
to other graduate students, other researchers, even advisors. Um, so some takeaways from this example, of course, uh, again, it's an excellent language for communicating ideas, mostly because of the tools of the scientific Python ecosystem that allow you to do this. Um, there aren't so many language specific things or sort of, you know, what I alluded to in the signal processing example and the fact that it's executable to me is, is or this executable pseudocode paradigm where it's so readable, but also um, operates efficiently is incredibly important. And readability is also important, not only for extensibility, so others being able to build upon your work, but also reproducibility, which is obviously very important for scientific research. And that brings us to the final point um, that I wanna talk about, which is the community and the community-based development model for Scientific Python, which to me is really the secret sauce, the, the thing that brings it all together, that makes Python um, that basically made Scientific Python what it is today, and in my opinion, is a, a great way of keeping it viable in the future. Um, so I mentioned that user contributor model, you know, when this started, um, most of the packages started from people who were doing research in their various domains and, and basically needed these tools to conduct their research. Um, and one of the huge advantages of, of having such a model is that um, the, there's a very strong connection between what users need and what actually gets implemented, both in terms of uh, not only features, but um, API interface design and everything like this. Um, and this is hugely important. I mean, if you talk to anyone who's ever been on a software project where there's you know, a top-down management structure, there's always the complaint of, oh, you know, the project manager wants this, um, but the people who are implementing it don't think it's a good idea, and there's just a disconnect between decision-making and uh, the people who are doing the implementation. And I think that the user contributor model is, is just about the best way of avoiding that particular pitfall. Of course, it's subject to, you know, its own challenges, like building consensus among the community is obviously uh, a, a challenge that you face, but I, I do think that this is a key component of why Scientific Python has been so successful. Um, there's also this, this really nice organically developed um, consistency amongst what we call now the Scientific Python ecosystem, right? So there's uh, fundamental data interchange objects like NumPy arrays, and of course, Matplotlib knows how to indirect, you know, is built on top of NumPy arrays. So you get a uh, visualization of array data and then um, the scikits and scipy and just having this fundamental data interchange object means that all of this functionality basically works together, even though the developer communities are often, um, you know, different. They're, it's, it's different people. All of the projects have their own styles and, and um, different uh, individual communities, but in the end, the the projects all work very well together, uh, and that's super important. And of course, I mentioned the the Dask example with in interoperability. You know, this is another preventing fragmentation of the ecosystem. So rather than having you know uh, a, a hard fork every time someone comes up with a new array structure, um, you know being able to use NumPy as an API to being, being able to use um, these high level sort of array analysis concepts with other structures that add even more features is an incredibly important component and does, you know, help prevent fragmentation and, you know, us having, you know, many different uh, scientific Python ecosystems. Um, and from a, Contributor perspective, I think another thing that's really nice is that although the communities are all independent, um, they all share very similar development practices, which means that if you become interested in contributing to a particular project, the more that you learn, the you know those what you learn tends to translate relatively well to other projects, which means that you're no you know you're not just a NumPy contributor it's very likely that you can become a SciPy contributor and start contributing to other maybe application or domain specific libraries that you're interested in. Um, and I think that really helps from a 
contributor perspective. But the big question going forward is, I, I think it's inarguable that Python has made a, a big splash in, uh, in scientific data analysis, data-driven research, especially since you know, 2014, 2015, whenever the, we started calling it data science. Um, you know, it, it's taken on a, a huge primacy in, in this type of research, but the question is, you know, what, what is the outlook moving forward? Is this sustainable? Uh, what are the challenges and what are the, how can we possibly address them? And so keeping the ecosystem healthy, I think is, is one of the most important things that we can put effort into now. And so I wanted to just plug some of the efforts that the team uh, that I'm on with Stefan and other contributors are pushing now, which is um, one of the main themes is to sort of try to build even more coherence um, into the scientific Python ecosystem. So, you know, support and leave in place the uh, developer model, the, the user contributor model, but also um, increase the level of coordination between various projects. So I just wanted to highlight that we've recently put up, so we have the scientificpython.org uh, site, um, which includes um, a new discussion forum. So this is a, a discourse-based discussion forum um, that we're hoping will be uh, a nice centralized place where people can just discuss topics that might be related not only to specific packages, but also to just ecosystem wide. Um, there's a really interesting discussion that was added not too long ago about um, how we can, you know, expand the support for other array objects into other libraries. So, I mean, this is a really interesting discussion. There's some really interesting proposals. Um, from various community members up here. I, if you're interested, I highly recommend taking a look at this and also the other discussions that are available. Um, so this is a big, a key component is having a platform where decision-making that can affect multiple projects can be discussed publicly in the open um, and get, you know, gather as many perspectives as, as possible. Um, there's also a more formal mechanism that we are introducing um, to formalize coordination between the projects. So there's this, this mechanism called the Scientific Python Ecosystem Coordination Documents, or SPECS for short. Um, and this is something that where, for example, um, in Python 3.7 with the uh, module get adder and dir dunders, that opens up an avenue for an interesting approach to lazy loading uh, modules and, and sub packages within Python projects. And so there's a question of exploring in that particular direction and also um, doing so in a way that is consistent among different projects. So, um, you know, you don't have one unique system for scikit-image and another completely different unique system for network X. Um, uh, for example, and so that's that's sort of where this um, these discussions, when they turn into something that might be a more formalized procedure, uh, the spec mechanism is designed to capture that and communicate that information to the projects in the ecosystem. And then, uh, of course, an important component is growth. Nothing is static, um, and we want to continue. To, uh, all projects, I'm sure, need to continually add new features um, and continually improve, but in a sustainable way. And I think this is somewhere where the national labs, you know, can contribute um, massively. And something that I'm personally very interested in is to sort of explore ways to get tech, you know, tech transfer, which is a big word in the national labs, I remember. Um, but to get that into open source, um, you know, there's a long history of the national labs directly supporting a lot of these uh, open initiatives. Um, you know, just to highlight a few because I'm familiar with them. Of course, NumPy came, uh, the predecessor was Numeric, which was largely developed and influenced at uh, Livermore uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, Network X, of course, started at Los Alamos. Um, 
I, I believe Dan was the, or, or I, sorry, Eric Hagberg was the speaker last week um, and sort of gave the history of NetworkX and how it started and how it became sort of a, a, a wider project. Um, and of course, this isn't limited only to Python projects. There are many, many other projects. Uh, another one I just wanted to call out briefly is the L Fortran project. So an interactive uh, Fortran, which is, is really cool. Um, and it doesn't have to be all independent projects, right? So there are many other examples of uh, research that has been done in the labs that is shared, but also incorporated within other projects. And I chose the super LU example just because I was I ran in it, into it the other day when I was looking at um, some network X uh, sparse linear algebra stuff. So there is the super LU package from NERSC developed by uh, researchers, I think primarily, I, I'm not sure, but primarily at uh, LBL. And if we look, you know, there are, they have their code on GitHub and it's all available, um, but also it is available in SciPy sparse LinAlge. Um, and I think the point that I want to really drive home here is that, and it's very hand wavy and anecdotal, but incorporating this work into a package that has so much, that has the level of visibility and um, adoption of SciPy is something that really benefits both the users of these packages and the original researchers. So the users, it's obvious, they have access to this, you know, excellent sparse uh, factorization technique, but also in terms of impact, um, if we, again, very hand wavy and, you know, this is not how you typically, you know, this is not an accurate measure of impact by any means, but if you look at the relative, you know, 60 forks um, and 14 watchers versus, you know, SciPy, which you just on the front page, it's almost half a million um, dependents. And of course, maybe only a fraction of them are interested in, in sparse, uh, sparse linear algebra, but even so, you know, this is, it's reaching a humongous community of potential users means more eyes on code and many more applications of the original uh, code. And I think that that is hugely important. And so one of the things that I really want to do is to help with this tech transfer process. I, that I think, um, you know, there's so much, there's so much like excellent world changing research sitting in the national labs. And I think that having it accessible to people would be mutually beneficial both to the researchers and to potential users. Of course, not everything belongs in SciPy, so it's not like you have to add a, a SciPy sub package for everything. Um, and having the ability to make your own scientific Python package um, is very important. And so we wanna lower the barrier to entry to that. Um, and so this is sort of an idea that we're kicking around that I'm really interested in is to have this, um, a manual that sort of collates best practices from the various scientific Python ecosystem projects. So, you know, this is currently just an idea. I haven't actually done anything, but things like, you know, how to set up documentation systems, testing frameworks, um, CI systems, things like this, things to lower the barrier to entry to um, others who, back to the presentation, who, uh, maybe have, you know, excellent code, but aren't quite sure how best to get it out, and make it easy for other people to use. Um, so I think, you know, this is a really interesting idea. I'm very interested to hear what other people think about something like this. Um, and with that, I will uh, shut up and we can start discussing, which is what I'm really interested in. So please, I just want to throw this out there. Um, if you have any ideas, you have things that you disagree with, uh, you want to get involved in any project, but particularly NumPy, NetworkX. You want to publish your own work in an, in, you know, an open way, uh, become an ecosystem project. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always, I'm, I love discussing this stuff. Also, gamma ray imaging and, and uh, signal processing, super interested. So please um, reach out and uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So thank you for that, Ross, and for those prepared remarks. I do want to try and reserve just a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, as the first question, I noticed that the efforts that you're embarking on are 
being embarked upon similarly at other labs as well. Dan, would you like to share with everybody the similar effort that's going on in NSLS2? Oh, sure. On, on that very last point, we also have users where I guess our, our model of them is they have a medium-sized Python project that they're working on with more than just their, their future selves as the collaborator, right? Maybe a couple uh, visiting users at their facility or maybe just researchers across uh, the staff group. And we put together some documentation that we call the Scientific Python Cookie Cutter that is both a template and a guide. And uh, it's, it's about a year stale. It still recommends Travis CI and the world has moved on to GitHub Actions, a couple things like that. But uh, I'd love to, to read up on what you've done and uh, you know join forces and learn about other stuff happening in this space. Now, I have a question as a follow-up to Ross's presentation, especially the point about Python as a tool for human expressivity. Your NumPy code doesn't look that dissimilar to, say, the equivalent MATLAB code, and the MATLAB, matplotlib code doesn't look that dissimilar. What is Python really adding here? And as an additional follow-up, if you're right, doesn't that mean that NumPy code is self-documenting? But I'd like to hear from Pete, you know, Self-documenting code is something I'm sure we've heard many times before, and we've been penalized by people assuming their code is self-documenting. How do we actually find that middle ground? So, Ross? Um, so, to address, can you repeat the, the first question, or, or your first Is point? NumPy code any more readable than MATLAB code? Oh, uh, well, no, I think the big difference there, um, you know, in terms of array semantics, of course, MATLAB has that too. The big difference is that everyone inherently has access by, uh, by default, whereas that may not be the case for others. So, um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not super plugged into the, the history of what got NumPy started, but I think that that was a relatively big motivating factor was the, the fact that we need, you know, an array data structure that has this powerful array semantics in order for expressing ideas, but in a way that's accessible to other people. And I think that you see this um, in the adoption of scientific Python, just you know, for data science for, for everywhere. And I think having that be open and accessible to everybody is a is an incredibly important component. Stefan, did you have a follow up about the readability of NumPy in comparison to past tools? Yeah, I don't I don't think we would ever argue that you know NumPy or Python is is better on on any individual axis than than uh, all the other solutions out there. I think it's what we bring together. It's the um, you have good syntax, but it's backed by the community. Uh, you don't need license license keys and dongles and that sort of thing. You know, the community really owns this work um, and the way that it ties into the the wider ecosystem. That's that's what. And it's interesting. It's interesting what you say, Stefan, because I would personally disagree. I think that Python is actually markedly more readable than other languages. Uh, one of our colleagues, Aaron Muir, one of the core developers behind SymPy, has some comments about this as well, talking about how Python is one of the few languages that gets to ergonomics. But I'm really interested to hear from Pete, because if it really is the case that Python is about human expressivity and communication, how does that interact with our need to document code? Does it mean that we don't have to document anymore? Does it mean we have to continue documenting? Are there different approaches we take for Ross's equations, could you document them any better than the equations themselves? What do you think, Pete? And Pete, let's get you off mute. Yeah. So, what NumPy provides is the ability to reduce the amount of jargon that appears in the equations. So, very much like that, it harkens back to even some of the older programming languages so that it cuts out all of the uh, mechanics so that you can actually talk with arrays. And so now I can do an array operation and it actually looks like the textbook. Uh, setting up some of this can actually look quite a bit like jargon. And so this is really where programming style, the programmer, comes in to play. Are they writing code that looks like it's self-documenting? It's possible to write very obtuse looking code with NumPy or Python, just as any other tool. So I think that probably is one of the keys in uh, Python does help that quite a bit. Tom, did you have something to add? Uh, I'll say that like, uh, even if you get the NumPy code to look very much like what the equations you're trying to implement are, 
like we don't publish research papers in science or math, but just like not equations and nothing else. There's there's pros around it to explain what the shorthand of the equations means. And so I think you, you can never get away from that, even in, in the code. And I'm curious, Tom, that you've thrown your your two cents in. What's the longest block of Matlab, matplotlib user code that you can read without saying, okay, I need to go through this line by line? Because for me, after 50 lines of plotting, setup, and configuration and whatnot, I'm just like, I'm just gonna rewrite this from scratch. And, and how does that affect this story of Python being readable? I, I mean, I think it is, I'm going to uh, repeat what Pete said. I think it comes down to how it's written because you can, you can have 20 lines that are dense and, and very difficult to read and understand or 200 lines that are, that are well organized and that you can read through and see a story in and, or, and work with it. So I think it, it depends. Fair enough. Now, of course, for those of you who are still with us, make sure to use that Q&A widget to add any questions that you might have, and we'll bring it to everybody. I'm going to go through some of the discussion that occurred during the prepared remarks and pick out just a couple of things which I think would be interesting to repeat. There was a little bit of discussion about where Python has been in the last couple of decades and the work that has, has led to what we see today. I'm very curious. There's a lot of competitive tools with Python today, and they're much, much younger, five years old, 10 years old. What was really learned over the first 20 years of Python or the first 10 years of NumPy that some other tool can't just replicate in a year of time or two years of time? Is there really hard-earned experience there? Stefan, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I think any long-term effort to develop scientific code in any such effort, you um, you learn a lot, and we try and build on that experience. So, you know, NumPy and the SciPy ecosystem, it wasn't built in isolation. They, there are a lot of uh, Fort, Fortran libraries underneath the hood that we we wrap to to utilize, um, you know, previous experience. And in the same way, I think, uh, you know, when when Julia came along, we we worked hard to get bridges built between Python and Julia, because a lot of the effort is really in, um, you know, implementing the algorithms, checking their correctness. Uh, it's a huge amount of work to to implement all those algorithms. So you're not just going to replicate that in a weekend. Uh, but as long as we build bridges between the different systems, we can utilize that work without letting it go to waste. Ross, did you have something to add? No, I just reiterate what Stefan said, and and also, I don't. In my experience, anyways, I don't view anything as necessarily like other languages as com as a competitive or antagonistic relationship. You know, that's one of the the points with Python is is just because of the language flexibility. You know, you can. I, I don't want to say consume or subsume or you know th there isn't really anything I think that uh, in other languages that you can't build bridges to if you want to and then you have the power of what already exists in Python and I think that that is a really nice um, feature to have and I think someone put in the chat uh, the you know Nathan Smith quote uh, Python is the second best language for everything and I think that speaks to the you know the, the core of the thing with uh, the core of the idea with generality and that um, of course you can always find application specific uh, languages or programs or things that will perform better than the equivalent Python um, for something that's very specific but there in terms of the ability to do you know to accomplish every task that you might want to do I think that um, you know Python really has an edge there. Now, the genesis of the question was a comment from Tom about zero copy moves between Fortran, C, Python, Julia. And I presume, Tom, you're referring to things like Apache Arrow. This is, these are technologies that you're investing in for work like Blue Sky. How is that working out? Is Arrow a good tool in practice? What does it allow you to do that you couldn't do before? So I think uh, Dan would like to jump in. He, he, Dan's been leading the effort on that. I think the where this going for is that strided arrays are, you know, to bluntly like why we have nice things. 
right? That you can train, that you can do all this cross communication. Like they're, they're kind of like the the most basic data structure for scientific data. But you lose things like I now have two arrays. I know one is my you know one is my is channel A and one is channel B. And there's some relation between those two that is important for your science. That when they're just two two NumPy arrays in your namespace gets lost. And when you go up a level of abstraction to something like an X-ray or a pandas or an awkward where you have names and then the data structure enforces these two are the same size. And because of that, you know more about the data. That's, I think, the ability to interchange that level of data structure between languages without having to do it as a ad hoc every time is going to be the next big revolution we see in scientific computing. And I think Arrow is probably the the leader of that right now in terms of uh, concrete implementations. But I'm not, I, I think it's to be seen if it, it holds up for a decade. There, you know, there could be, you know, a second generation. And, and yeah, Dan, I think, Tom, okay. I, I think I can build on that. I think that seems like a fair assessment. And uh, Arrow is very focused on, on, on tabular data, generally columns of scale or numbers, but Awkward has shown Awkward Array out of the high energy physics community has shown that you can attach the end Dan, dimensional. Can I interrupt you? Can you introduce yep. Awkward Array to everybody? Yeah, Awkward Array is a project for representing ragged, jagged arrays that might not be uh, shaped like blocks anymore. And so you can have these uh, like nested uh, structures, almost like a nested dictionary in Python with arrays in it. Any shape like that can be represented in, in Awkward. And they are basing their representation on Arrow. So these are really interesting things. And I think my my big picture for these are things we're just starting to learn about and not yet putting on the experimental for it. NSLS2, I can't speak to what other facilities might be using, uh, might be doing with it already. I think what we're learning is that um, as people who've lived in the sci-fi community for a while, we know that if you standardize on a NumPy array or you standardize on a data frame or X-ray, you can move these objects between programs that weren't designed to cooperate. And you know, Ross really got at that in his talk in the way that the, the user contributors can create these, these tool chains that rely on a lot of people's expertise who don't even know each other and might not even know who's using their tools. I think when we talk about Apache Arrow or these, these shared structures, that's one layer below that. And it's hard to get a whole ecosystem to agree that X-Ray is the right tool versus Pandas is the right tool versus Awkward. There are different places where the different design trade-offs make sense, but we're starting to see the possibility of uh, of sharing the data underneath those things, at least when it's stored or when it's being moved around. And Dan and Tom, do you want to briefly talk about Tiled and introduce that to everybody? Uh, sure. We put a press release that was on the front page of bnl.gov last week and ought to be Googleable, or maybe maybe Tom can put a link in a chat while I talk about uh, trying to think about data access in this structural way. So not having to know that the data happens to be an HDF5 file or a directory of TIFFs or uh, an Excel spreadsheet under the hood, just asking for it in the format that your code wants it. So if your code is a data science program in Python or Julia, it might want Arrow or C uh, strided arrays. Uh, if it is uh, image J, it might want a TIFF. Or if, if it's a web browser, it might want a ping image and basically uh, handing the data to the user's software in whatever format it wants, giving us the freedom to change how we store it at the back end without breaking the scientist's code. I'm curious about one thing, Pete. At your site, everybody on the beam line has their own instrument. How important is data sharing and how critical is the ability to be able to share data efficiently using tools like Arrow or with platforms like Tiled? I don't know enough about Arrow to comment on it. Tiled, it looks like the sort of technology that we want to be using at the APS because the data sharing doesn't share between instruments at much as it shares between the instrument and the scientific community that's using it. So currently the ways that we exfiltrate data are copy to local disk or do some sort of web transfer using Globus, for example. Uh, but the 
idea of having a data repository on site that is available for Globus transfer um, or user interaction off site is absolutely fabulous. And I think Tiled is part of that, key to that infrastructure. So Tiled is an experimental prototype currently. If I am a scientific user on your Beamline, Pete, and I need to share my data with an external party, what do I do until Tiled becomes something that's actually rolled out? So we use Globus, for example, uh, because now we're talking about medium to larger data. And frankly, most of the data at the APS is largest is medium scale, gigabytes, might approach terabytes, but not any larger than that on any typical data sets. So um, probably some technology involving Globus is the way that we do that. And the normal way, the usual reason why we have to do that is for high performance computing, moving the data to uh, off site, off of the APS campus, maybe to somewhere else at Argonne or to one of the other computation centers like NERSC, uh, but using Globus for those transfers. Now, there was one question that went unanswered in the Q&A widget, which was, we've been talking over these past couple of calls about Python and the 10-year plan for Python and whether it's a choice that we want to choose or not. Stefan and Ross, what are you looking forward to in the next 10 years for Python? What is coming down the pipe that's actually new or notable or novel or makes for a choice to use Python that isn't just, it's been around forever, anybody knows it? And if you were in charge of things, what would you want the next 10 years of Python to look like? What would you prioritize? But first, what is interesting and novel? Ross? Oh, I don't know that I'm the person to answer that question because <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, all of the projects have things that are interesting and novel. I think, I guess if I were, to highlight something specific for one of the projects that I work on would be Sebastian Berg's work on um, refactoring the data type system for NumPy. Um, so this has been a huge project and something that Sebastian has done an awesome job with. And what that will allow is uh, more full support for user D types. Um, one of the canonical examples is uh, unit D types. That's something that you know is a pretty common feature of Quest. A lot of different external libraries implement that, like AstroPy provides unit D types. There's like IUnit and Pint and some other ones. Um, but having that, the ability to incorporate that directly using the NumPy machinery, I think is a, is a nice layer of flexibility um, and is indicative of the types of features, I think, that are really exciting and you know show that it's you know it's a, it's a very difficult project to um you know to implement these new features without breaking backward compatibility and all these things and ensuring that you still have support for 20 years worth of num legacy code that uses numpy but also inject new ideas and allow new features for users Stefan, is extensible d type also your top i'm most excited it gets me up in the morning new development in the ecosystem? Well, I think what, what I'm most excited about right now is that we finally have um, the opportunity to do uh, better coordination between the uh, the projects. So I won't highlight any specific technologies. I mean, I think we'll be, we'll be um, working to uh, provide support for the various GPU architectures. We'll do a lot of work on uh, improving parallelized and distributed computing and all, all that sort of thing. Um, but really, I think the, fa the fact that we can now go out, uh, we have funding to go out to our various user communities, talk to them, find out uh, what their needs are and build those needs back into the, um, into the projects and also uh, coordinate better between the projects to create cohesion for our users that, uh, that I think is going to make uh, the ecosystem uh, better. Yeah, just just to build on that, Stefan, I think the over the last couple of years between funding from uh, CZI and the re the recent round of NASA grants, a number of the core projects in Python have significant amount of um, paid developers, which is a, a new and novel thing at this scale for us. And what you can do with a a 
I, there's probably a dozen people now across all the projects working full time. These coordination things that were used to be much harder because they relied on people doing this, you know, nights and weekends or grad students who would fit it in between their other work. Um, just we can do it at a much higher fidelity now. Uh, additionally, CCI specifically funded um, a number of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, efforts, uh, including one with um, Matplotlib, NumPy, SciPy, and Pandas, where we're hiring um, contributor experience leads to help make sure our processes are as opening and welcoming as possible to try to address some of these longstanding uh, imbalances in what our contributors uh, uh, pool is. Are these positions open to full-time lab staff? Is this something which folks on this call could apply for? Uh, they are full-time positions that we've already, we're already pretty far down the interview process for. Okay. Now, as we wrap up this call, I'm very curious to hear from everybody. We've talked about why Python for the last two calls. And we've talked about maybe why not Python, or we've talked about the other alternatives and how Python fits into a nice ecosystem. I think Ross gave a very compelling view on many things that make very Python special. But I'm curious, for a fun little question before we end, for each of our panelists, what would you change about Python if you could? If you were the benevolent dictator for life for Python, and they went back to the system, what would you abandon? What would you say, no, we're not going down that track? Or what would you say, we should double down on this? And I'll give everybody a, a chance to think. While all of our panelists have a chance to think on that question, I want to say we will be resuming these events next year with the first event at the end of January. We are looking for more host panelists. If your site is, some, is a site where you use Python, or if you're just a one Python user among a bunch of other MATLAB or Fortran or C users, but you want to be a part of a larger community of people who are looking to make Python thrive, please reach out to us. We would love to have more host panelists for our upcoming calls that we do next year. And with that said, Ross, have you thought about what you would change about Python if you could? Um, well, there are, you know, we've talked a lot about coordination amongst uh, ecosystem projects, you know, amongst scientific Python, but um, I think, there is also the question of coordinating with uh, Python, the language itself. And I do think, and this is, and this might be a hot take, it's a very personal opinion, uh, but as, as, a, as an example of this, uh, I feel that things like new language features like type annotations, for example, um, have gained a lot of traction and received a ton of attention in Python proper. Um, and have been slower to be adopted in, in scientific Python. And I think a lot of the, are, and I think type annotations are, are fine, but I think a lot of the motivations for type annotations have, like, I personally don't find compelling. Like, I'm not an IDE user. Um, so, you know, the things about some of the features that it adds that are specific to tooling um, aren't as interesting to me. And, so that I think increasing the level of cohesion in some of the opinions that go into the decision making for Python itself versus you know scientific Python as a humongous subset of Python users, um, I think having more of a voice in in sort of the general Python discussion would be something that would be beneficial. So you heard it from Ross. Vote for Ross if you want no more of this PEP 484. Vice President David Beasley, by the way. But moving on, Stefan, what would you change about Python if you could? And just to be clear, like I've been implementing type annotation in infrastructure in Network X. So, you know, what the people want, they get, you know, but that's just my personal hot take. Go. Yeah, I think that, that touches on a broader theme, which like language features that we thought we didn't need in the beginning and then later on turned out would become quite important. Uh, we we did not pay a lot of attention to performance initially, which is why NumPy had to be written. Um, and But I think that it ended up biting us. It, it, it became a, a point of contention on why you should adopt Python people. You know, it's hard to get rid of the notion that for loops are slow even though that's often not the, the place where people get slowed down. Um, but there is an effort underway now to increase the speed of uh, core Python by two, three, four, five times. Um, so I'm hopeful for that. 
I hope we can improve the way we uh, in interact with uh, with threads. Um, there's some movements on poten potentially getting rid of the gill. We'll see if that goes anywhere. Um, and then just a small one, a personal one. Uh, we've been implementing lazy loading infrastructure for the um, for the scientific Python projects, and um, kind of hoped that we could get that into the core. But it looks like that that won't happen. So fortunately, we have the mechanisms to do it outside of that. But that would have been a nice. So you heard it from Stefan, no more Gil and accept every pull request from Victor Stinner or Pablo. Tom, what would you change about Python if you could? So I'm going to provide a very controversial hot take. I think from module import star should not should be removed. I love it. Simple message, kill from module import star, and everything else will work its, work its way out in the end. I love it. Dan? Yeah, I'll go back to the, the 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 language complexity and the features getting added to Python. I've been following a lot of the discussions around that, and I think a theme that is somewhat not resolvable, right, is that Python used to be a hobby language. It used to be relatively easy to understand every part of not only the language that you write, but how it gets run internally. And it used to be and might still be a pretty good teaching language, but as it adds more and more complexity and features, it gets away from being something that you can easily understand any given Python code that might land in front of you. And it's hard to do those things while also growing the features that you need if you want to see Python at the core of large scientific code bases. The thing you need doing the little data analysis script in, the, in your notebook versus building an HTTP data access service that scales well and is worked on by a dozen people are kind of different things. And Python is experiencing fitting all of that into one language and seeing if we can still hang. And, and we'll see. I, I'm optimistic, but it's a tricky balance that's never going to make everyone happy. So you heard it from Dan, straight reject on the PEP 671 syntax for late bound function argument defaults. We don't need more features. How do you know these numbers off the top of your head, Dan? I know everything. Uh, and Pete, lastly, what would you change about Python if you could? Not been mentioned, but what I need to have better access to are when things go wrong, I need better diagnostics, memory allocation, dangling objects in the universe, namespaces. These things are either too complex in the documentation to implement realistically at a user level, or they're not implemented at all, but um, Stack Overflow doesn't really help me on these. So those are actually my big ones. Uh, another one that we could definitely use is a durable model for people to use for when they're making a package that needs plugins, that supports plugins. So we need a plugin architecture that is nice and reusable. We need for plugin architecture what NumPy did for arrays. That's really it. So I'll lay that out squarely. And I am not a fan of annotations. I've used strongly typed languages. You can argue for a strongly typed language. This is a feature that some aestheticists in Python seem to want to have. But from a user point of view, deep six it. This it's actually why I like Python is it's not a strongly typed language. And now we're moving away from that. Send it to the seller. And you heard it from Pete, a mix of better debugging, better instrumentation, but also PEP44, not that convinced. I'll answer this question and then we'll adjourn. What I'd like to see if I could change Python if I could is, the majority of growth of Python has been from the data science and the hard sciences. It is the scientific computing community that is making Python's next 10 years what the previous 20 years have looked like. It is where all the growth and all the excitement is happening. And I think the Python community needs to recognize that this is the source of growth. It needs to understand that our use cases as scientific users are very important to the longevity of the language and the popularity of the language. And it needs to understand that as a community, our voice matters in the direction of the language. And that's exactly why this call exists, exactly why this is here. Thank you all for joining us. Happy holidays, and we'll see you all in January for the next Python Exchange. Thanks, everybody.